following preview was begrudgingly approved for all audiences. You're listening to Elevator Music. Welcome back to Forward Thinking, presented by the PCL. I'm Ricky Vellante, and I'm joined by my co-host, two-time NBA champion, David West. This is a weekly podcast focusing on those that challenge the status quo to do social good and bring about positive change to the world while also talking a little bit of sports. And this week we're joined by the distinguished Howard Bryant, uh, intellectual author, thinker, scholar. I thought the conversation was great with Howard. You guys are really going to enjoy it. We dove into a bunch of different topics, we talked about current state of college sports. We talked about the employment of African-American coaches. We talked about the general nature of our society. It was definitely a conversation I think you all enjoy and hope you look forward to, to checking it out. Be sure to check out thepcleague.com slash forward thinking where you can subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and your other favorite podcast outlets. Thank you, everybody, for joining us again. We've got a special guest for you today, ESPN contributor, author, political thinker, in my opinion, or personally, one of the, one of the intellectual minds that I, I sort of look to to sort of shape and give me a context for certain things. The incomparable Howard Bryant, author of Full Dissidents and The Heritage, both two powerful books I suggest folks check out. We thank you for joining us today, Howard. Thank you for having me. And I was going to say, even though I'm in Massachusetts, I think everyone should watch anyway, even that Yankee hat on. I don't mind. <laughs> I have no problem with it. Right. New Englanders around here might be like, what is, what is that? Right, right, right. <laughs> I got, I got he, he wears it every episode. Right. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm loving it. The new book I'm working on right now is a biography on Ricky Henderson. So I'm writing about wow. those. There's Yankee years right now, so I'm looking at Billy Martin and Reggie and Winfield and all those dudes, so it's been a lot of fun. Hey, Winfield. He lived in Teaneck, where I grew up. I was going to say, all those guys are up there. Teaneck and, um, and what's the town right over? Fort Lee? That's where all the Yankees are. Yeah, Fort are. Lee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Fort Lee. Yeah. So, Howard, you've, uh, you've done, as David mentioned, a couple of really interesting books, The Heritage, Full Dissidents. You know, I always look to you as one of the the better writers and thinkers around shaping the treatment of black athletes in the United States, both presently and historically. In particular, let's maybe start with college sports and yeah. how, in your opinion, universities have been able to basically build a business mostly on the backs of, of black athletes. Yeah, I, I think one of the big things that we really don't talk about, and obviously David can speak to this from personal experience, that. Um, this pathway that we had talked about for years, for decades, actually, you know, of, of black integration into the mainstream really does start with sports. And when you, you, know, you go back and if you're looking at University of Alabama in the 60s, not integrating, if you look at a lot of those, the, you know, University of Kentucky, you look at the schools down there that really didn't want to integrate, the pathway to get your, you know, your doctors and your lawyers and your journalists and everybody else really came first through having black athletes on campus. And <clears throat> that story to me, we've lost it because we've lost it simply because the money in the, in the game has gotten so big. In a lot of ways, we've forgotten why the athletes are there in the first place. And, you know, with the, the, the place that we're in right now, it, it, you know, I've been asking the question, obviously you, you guys are right in the center of this about whether to pay or not pay athletes. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember thinking, I think what really hit me when I was working on the Heritage was there was a, I think there was an NCAA game. It was West Virginia. I don't remember who they were playing. And one of the announcers had said something like that West Virginia is the most traveled school in the tournament. They've traveled 37,000 miles this season. And I'm like, 37,000 miles? Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Like, <laughs> when did y'all go to school? <laughs> <laughs> actually getting an education here and then on top of that there was a 30 for 30 and they were talking about um was it the US no it was the XFL and it was all about trying to get that league going and so many of the players were talking about 
getting the phone call that they were going to do, you know, be part of this new league. And each one of them came from big time D1 schools. And a lot of them were black players. And they were talking about how they wanted this second chance to play. And that this guy was working at Lowe's and this guy was working at Sears and this guy was working at the Home Depot when the phone rang. And I'm thinking, where's your education? It, where's, you know, so you blew your knee out in your, work, in your, in your stack and shelves at, at Lowe's and I'm thinking, wait a minute, I don't know that many people on my side of the world who went to those schools when I was at Temple and went to those schools who have that trajectory. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, wait a minute, <clears throat> excuse me, there's an arc here that we've completely lost. Right. And it was really important to start to dive into that, to look at, okay, on the one hand, you start thinking, all right, if this is what we are, if this is a surrender, then absolutely you need to compensate players. But even if you do that, you still have to think about the fact that the NCAA has completely lost <clears throat> the entire educational mission that should be a component of this as well. What, what role should they play in actively making sure that these players get some form of a proper education? Yeah, I actually, I don't know the answer to that because it's, it's an answer within an answer. Because one of the things is that you're thinking about preparation, right? right. It reminds me back when I was working on, um, and when I was covering baseball, working on PEDs in the, in the 2000s, in the late 90s. And I remember talking to Dick Pound over at, at, um, at WADA, and he, we were talking about cycling and swimming. And, and he was saying, you know, one of the big questions that we have in the anti-doping community is, do you want a clean race or do you want a fast race? That was question number one. And so now when we go back to this question, David, I think how many of these athletes that you're bringing in could handle the coursework anyway? So do you want, you know, so it really does go back to preparation in high school and, 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 and you know, the skill set and the educational set that a lot of the, the athletes are coming into in the first place when they get to the university level. I mean, nothing the school can do for you once you get there if you're not prepared for it. But at the same time, if you can ball, then that's why you're there. That's why, that's why this conundrum is so, is so powerful and that's why it's, it's not easy. But obviously, I mean, I think to me, when I think about it, I go down two levels. I go down to what education are you getting before you walk in the door? And if we're going to conclude, as the NCAA concludes, that they can have a system where they don't have to compensate the player and they're not going to recognize that the player is here to provide revenue for the university, then they do have an enormous responsibility to educate and prepare the players. As of right now, it's structured that college athletes are ca capped at a cost of attendance scholarship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I get really, really frustrated when people say that they're getting a free education because that's <laughs> not the case. <laughs> if you have to do something to get something, it's not free. Right, and right. so in the context of, of college athletics, though, if the exchange of goods for that athlete to provide their services is a scholarship and, and that's, mm -hmm. that's all they get, then wouldn't the university have a responsibility to make sure that that's a, a proper exchange? Because as a college athlete, you know, certain classes, certain majors, the moment that you're an athlete, you no longer get access to them. That's right. That's right. And on, and on top of that, not, you know, not just the proper, the, the proper access and, the, and the, the proper framework of it, but also <clears throat> to stop calling it four free years. They're one year renewables. And so when you start talking about edu educating the public on what you're actually getting, the, the university system, the NCAA, they profit from this ignorance. They profit from people thinking, oh, well, it's all free once you walk in the door. I tell professional athletes all the time, I, um, you guys work way harder than we do. You have less security than we do. You do everything more than we do. And, and there's not somebody right behind me trying to take everything I have on a daily basis. So right. you start attaching the word free to the athlete. There are so many different layers that come with that and so many different so many different elements that we're really talking about. We're talking about resentment. We're talking about racism. We're talking about lack of professional respect. We're talking about all of these different things tied into a financial system. And the, the problem, the biggest problem that I see with that, to, to your point, Ricky, is, is yes, the, the NCAA as a system is profiting and it's to their advantage to not have any of these conversations. 
it's it's so important to me whenever I talk to to people, and I think college is even more pronounced than the pros because people feel a personal connection to their universities. I mean, when we were dealing with the second mile stuff, I mean, the fact that people were so tied to Penn State, they were blinded by what was actually happening. Right. And you talk about your school, you know, there's a connection to your college, you know, to your university as, a, as, a, as your alma mater. So the first thing we have to do is essentially what, what you guys are doing right now is to, is to really break down all of the hypocrisies that are taking place so you can start with, a, with an honest foundation. You can't even have a conversation if the foundation isn't honest. Yeah, and I think we've talked about this in previous episodes, but something that, that people are either uncomfortable to discuss or are willfully ignorant about is the racial component of college athletics, especially as it relates to the revenue generating sports. College football, you're looking at somewhere around 54 to 55% of the scholarship athletes are black. Uh, if you're looking at men's basketball, it's closer to 57 to 58%. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at starters versus non-starters, the, the disparity becomes even, even greater, where now you're looking at 80 to 90% in some cases. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So again, in, in covering sports as long as you have and in telling some of these stories, is it a lack of comfort in just willing to discuss it or is it willful ignorance? Well, uh, I mean, I think that it depends on who we're talking to. I think that, or who we're talking about. I think at, at ESPN and I think at, at our level journalistically, whether you're talking when I was at the Washington Post or whether you're talking about being at ESPN, the, the value systems are different, the dynamics are different because obviously one is a newspaper but rights holder. I, I, I think that it depends on your mission. And I think that if your mission, I mean, let's just say it, my problem with where we are right now is I don't think that our mission is to give the black athlete a voice. I think the mission is to have black athletes athletes in particular, but specifically black athletes because of where African Americans are in the country politically and sociologically. The goal is to have them shut up and play. The goal is not to create a rounded citizen. The goal is not to hear from a rounded, complete citizen. We don't need that because then, I mean, that's the reason why in, in my book, Full Dissidents, the first sentence is to be black is to be a dissident. And the reason is, is that once you start talking about these issues, now it's not fun anymore. Now, all of a sudden, your fun and games and your entertainment are being intruded upon by the realities of the people that you're paying to see. Right. And do we care about their reality? Do we as journalists care about their reality? Or do we care about the final score and going downstairs and interviewing guys and then going back upstairs, you know, and eating, you know, lousy food in the press box? So, I mean, I think that what we're really talking about is the motivation on the part of the people who are supposed to be the conduits, which is us. And I found over the course of my career, and I think it's getting worse, that the athlete is here to entertain us. And the athlete is here to entertain the fans. And the, the, the point, one of the points that I've been trying to make for the last several years now is to, is, is to say, why is the athlete, especially the black athlete's position so offensive? Why is it so dangerous? Why is it so problematic? Why is it so risky? And this is the reason, because once you have an educated workforce and once you have a workforce that is actually able and willing to unravel this entire industry and all of its contradictions, now you've got a different conversation and you've got to face things that people don't want to face. And so I, I think that, you know, to answer, to answer the question, I, I really believe that we have a responsibility as journalists that we, we fail with, we fail miserably quite constantly. And then also, I think the, the, the political, and of course, when you start adding the money to it, do you want to hear from the people that you're paying to watch? And, and I think a lot of times the answer is no. Right. I, I, will, you know, I personally will interject a little bit here. I, I experienced this a little bit in Indiana when during the Donald Sterling thing, mm -hmm. I was one of the first guys to jump out there because you know, the way I found out about that whole situation was, you know, really random. I was in the locker room, reporter, uh, Candace Buckner, I believe her name was. Candace came up to me, like, kind of mentioned it to me, and I'm like, what? Like, literally maybe, you know, right before she had to leave the locker room before the game, 
you know, I kind of blurted some stuff out, but then after the game, I was able to digest it. It stung. And I remember saying, man, damn, like, this is like one of the things, like, I can't really let this go. I got to let some, some, some truthism out here. So I remember being in the locker room and reporters asking guys who were next to me, you know, asking Paul and literally Paul saying, look, y'all probably should ask D West that question. <laughs> and I literally watch six or eight report. I, I feel it like I know they're going to kind of look. They literally look my way and walk away. And mm-hmm. I learned, like, they just don't want to hear it. They don't want the perspective of an athlete that may not fit, you know, what they want from, from athletes. I, you know, also in Indiana, I remember things shifted when, when I first got there, I was recovering from my knee surgery. So I wasn't. I was trying to get confidence back physically. I was trying to come into myself and those things. But I felt like once people realized, yo, this dude's got a little bit of a little bit more than just the toughness on the court, it shifted people away because they were comfortable with me being an aggressive, tough, bruiser, ready to beat people up, that type <laughs> of stuff. But when it came to, you know, being able to articulate certain points and then also having a view. You know, that wasn't as comforting as they'd like. You know, you completely will get that that other side where they just completely ignore you. So I experienced that personally, you know, while I was in the NBA. Yeah, and I think also, I think what happens with that too is you're dealing with subjects. I mean, let's face it, we always used to, I refer to them as lifestyle guys on our, on our side of the business. There are a lot of reasons why people do this. A lot of people like the lifestyle. I have not worked in an office since 1997. I've been on the road, in the airport, in the press box. That's my life. And so a lot of guys, like you usually see this, David and Ricky, when it comes to labor. Usually when there's strike, lockout, guys are like, nah, nah. (laughs) They just don't, they don't want to cover it. But post Ed O'Bannon, post Ferguson, the world's getting more and more and more complicated. Then, of course, add Kaepernick into it. It's getting more and more complicated. And it's getting more and more cross-pollinated, like, for example, you're starting to look now and you see in the middle of a pandemic, you have a president that decides to go add commissioners to, not medical staff, but add right. commissioners to the, to the reopening committee. And so you cannot avoid this. Right. This cannot be avoided. That the, that the, the impact of sports, the influence of sports is so prevalent in the country now that you have to get involved in this whether you want to or not. And the problem is everybody knows immediately. It's almost as if you, you know, you're self-programmed. There's certain lines you can't cross. Right. Certain you don't wanna to go to. I find it interesting that you had guys walking away from you on that subject on Sterling because you were the one they needed to talk to. Right. And, and, and I remember thinking, and I was talking to Carmelo about this when I was working on the Heritage. And he was telling me that that there was a, a pretty good movement of players who really were like, we wouldn't play. And the, 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 the thought of the players shutting the game down over the transgressions of an owner. I mean, right. you're, in, you're in power structure mode right now. What was your, what was your feeling about that? Do, do you feel, I mean, I mean what, what, was, what did you think the, the temperature of the players were at that time? You know, I, I didn't, I knew that you know, guys were mad. You know, I felt the same. I, I, I had actually publicly stated, like, I didn't care. If that had come from an organization that I was a part of, my season would have been done because the, the language was so specific and so direct, particularly, mm-hmm. you, know, and, you know, I'm someone who reads history. I'm aware of the cultural impact that racism and structural racism has had in the formation of these leagues. Um, <laughs> yeah. And to hear him articulate it, I'm like, oh, hell no. Like, I, it just struck a different chord. And I think that's maybe not to that same level for other guys, but I know it struck guys in a way. Um, and I think it gave us, a, it gave us a, a, an opportunity to sort of measure the room, if you will, yeah. mm-hmm. um, to see where that general player awareness was. And I think based on where I came in the league in 2003 and then, you know, Sterling was maybe – you know, 2011 or 12 in that in that window or whatever mm-hmm. I felt like it had shifted and guys were a little bit more aware the, the awareness had come up and I again I've attributed it to 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 social media to a large large yeah. extent guys yeah. are on the bus on the phone you know like this they're on the plane like this and 
not everybody is, you know, surprisingly, not everybody is just watching videos and mm -hmm, listening mm -hmm. to listening to hip hop. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, and it's true. I mean, I, and I think that that there is so much of this that comes to that question of who you are against who we are. Okay, you're not me. I don't get to be you, right? There is you've got a world class ability that the rest of us don't have, right? I mean, how many people? in this world can say, I'm the best in the world at what I do. Not that very many people can say that. So when you're looking at us as employees, it's not the same as looking at you as an employee. So you have a level of power that we don't have. And yet constantly you see the, the conversation, these discussions framed as, well, if I did that at my job, well, you're not me. Right, you know? right, 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 right. There's one LeBron James, there's one Tom Brady, there's, you know, there, there, there aren't that many, you can't just replace those guys. You can replace me, I can get a phone call tomorrow and say, I'm gonna give somebody else a job. That's the reality of our universe, it's not the reality of your universe. Right. But yet, when you're dealing with the public and you're dealing with media, they're applying the same frameworks. Well, why are you talking politics at work? I can't talk politics at work. We don't do the same thing. And I think, once again, Ricky, that goes back to that point earlier about the NCAA, about just completely bulldozing this entire structure at some level with the intention of re-education, with the intention of saying, listen, let's create, and maybe this post-Ferguson Kaepernick period that we're in is going to create an entirely new generation, conversationally, where the athletes are expected and the athletes are respected for their opinions. But as I've said, what I see taking place over the last couple of years is a retrenchment of that, just like everything else in this country. I see that I see people in, you know, in the, in, with the leagues and also in media as well, recognizing that the balance has a potential to shift and to make sure it doesn't. Yeah, tying a, a few things together there that you all were just talking about. We're coming up on the NFL draft. So it's thinking about the formation and creation of these leagues, the control aspect of these players. You talk about this in full dissonance in terms of how the NFL successfully got the P, you know, different factions within the PA to almost turn on each other in terms mm -hmm. of rookie pay scales and yeah. how that allows these owners to cost control and replace older players to some extent. You know, again, talking about confronting aspects of sports that people aren't really comfortable with confronting. The draft is one of the most anti-labor <laughs> things in existence. <laughs> when you really think about it, when you take away the sport part of it, the, the walking across the stage, the hugs, all that stuff, it is so anti-player, and I don't think a lot of people realize that. I wrote a column on that in ESPN a few years ago. I think it was titled, Why Are You Hugging the Commission? And it was all about that ritual of the draft. But I think every NBA, I'm sorry, every NFL draft, I don't know if you guys are Key and Peele fans or not, but if you remember the Key and, <laughs> Key and Peele skin, I, I put a, a, a meme of that up there. Every NFL draft on Twitter, I just put And people get so mad. <laughs> they get mad. <laughs> and it's like the, the, the entire, when you watch the combine, no, oh, it's not during the draft, it's during the combine. That's when I do it. You know, when you see all these guys out there in their underwear running around, and it's like, you know, are we aware of what this actually looks like? Right. And, but on the other hand, you also have people say, well, these guys are getting a chance to live, live their dream. Why are you shitting on it? I'm not. I'm just saying this is what it looks like. But, but yeah, I, I think historically, and, and also when you're talking about that, that rookie wage that started in the NBA, actually, it yeah. was Len Robinson contract in yeah. 90 or 97 when the veterans were like why is he getting that much money and then the guys instead of coming together immediately were like no 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 you 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 have not made a basket in this league yet you are going to make the money that we're making right, so right. the anti-labor elements of it we're this is what we're taught and I, I think this is where if you go back and you look obviously it starts before that but if you just start look at, at the reagan years the the number of layers where we're anti-labor and the way that labor sort of cannibalizes itself, the way labor attacks each other. Um, it's really profound. And, and, and I think that what you find, 
the most dangerous thing is unity. And, you know, when you see baseball players, the reason why baseball always had the strongest union is because their stars made sure that they just weren't going to fold on each other, that stars were going to lead. You know, we were talking about the NFL not too long ago. Um, I remember who I was talking to about this. But you have to remember that in 1987, 20% crossed the line. I mean, can you imagine, you know, LeBron and Kobe and KG crossing the picket line? I mean, that's what happened in 87, and the NFL has never recovered. I mean, they just don't have any sort of power. But to your point about the draft, Ricky, I was thinking, I mean, obviously, with that hat you're wearing, David, you're part of the legacy. But <laughs> the reason why you have drafts in the first place in 1965 was to stop the Yankees. It was to stop these teams, you know, the idea that they were simply too powerful. And I think that I always felt, and I feel it even more strongly today, that how many times, and especially during this election, you know, you hear people talking about socialism, 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 and you talk about rugged free market capitalism. And then when you get to sports, they want drafts, they want caps, they want control. Well, they want luxury tax. <laughs> all of these different things. And the draft is actually center to it. I always felt like, okay, you know, bring it back to the old days. You have player, you cultivate player, you negotiate with player. Everybody's a free agent on their opening. And, you know, but, but once again, this, these systems have been in place for generations now. Now we're looking at 55 years of this. And so, and in fact, in the NBA, the NBA draft goes back into the early 50s. So if you, I'm sorry, it goes back to the late 40s, to the beginning. So how do you unlearn this? Do you want to unlearn it? And what level of interest? I think that when you talk to people, they'll tell you that there are so many other issues that are pressing right now that these fundamental issues can't be touched. And so, so you have these issues, and at the same time, people are like, well, we, we just don't want to deal with it. Right. Completely agree. And I always like to point some of these things out in the context of American sports versus global sports or, or international sports, you know, like the Premier League. There is no draft. You, yep. you have an academy system. You develop your own talent. Other teams have the ability to pluck talent from your academy if you don't pay them accordingly. Mm -hmm. And the, the best teams rise to the top. But it also doesn't create a system where it's only one or two teams. You know, they're in the Premier League in particular, you know, you've got five or six, sometimes seven, eight teams that realistically do have a shot at winning it. And yeah. so I think it puts the onus on the organization to just be better at their job. And instead of, you know, the idea of like tanking, you know, let's tank, let's, let's go after, you know, the top, top pick each year and let's try to turn things around that way. Instead, it's you have to identify talent, you have to sign the talent, you have to keep the talent happy <laughs> and then ultimately, you know, allow them to ascend through your through your system. Well, that's one of the things that we're talking about in, in baseball right now. And you're, you're looking at, especially from a racial standpoint, you're looking at baseball now. Baseball's got 750 players. There's 64 black players. That's what, oh. seven, 64 total African-American. And so you start looking at these different pipelines and you're saying, okay, well, why, why is that? And what are the implications of that? And you know, one of the great red herrings on this is that, oh, you know, black kids don't want to play baseball anymore and that they prefer basketball and they prefer football. When I was covering Washington, when I was covering the NFL, I was amazed at the number of brothers in that room that all played baseball. They were all right. baseball players. Anna Moss was a baseball player. Sean Taylor was a baseball player. Ronaldo wins, 6'3", 310 pounds, was a baseball player. <laughs> they were all playing baseball to start, and then they got funneled into these other areas. And so one of the areas to, to the point we were making earlier is that you know, you essentially have the economics of this. You've got three major issues. You know, number one, baseball as a game is essentially a white suburban sport that's reinforced by foreign labor. It's all Dominican. When you go down there in Latin America, the amount of resources they put down there. But then on top of that, the second point is you've got the two revenue sports, football and basketball. But, college, but baseball now goes to college to find players. Back when, when I was a kid in, in, in my early 20s and my, my career first started, baseball didn't want college athletes nearly as much because they wanted to develop their own athletes to the point you were making about soccer. 
that they wanted, they didn't want anybody messing with the swings. They wanted you out of high school and they were going to draft you and they were going to develop. you. Mm. But now because the money's so big, they need somebody else to do that development for you so you can get to the big leagues faster. It's only one problem though. College baseball is 1.8% black. So if college is now where you're going to get your, your athletes, if you're major league baseball, no wonder you're not getting any black people. You're, you're spending millions of dollars to get Latin American players because you can buy 100 Latin players for one American draft pick. You're, the draft picks you're getting are from college, and so there are no black kids playing baseball, playing college baseball. And now the third piece of it is that baseball has become such an expensive travel sport that it's pricing out for blacks and for whites. So mm-hmm. three different main layers where you're finding talent. You're, not, you're, you're looking for black people where there are no black people. And then people sit around and go, well, how come there are no black people? Follow the money and follow the, you know, follow the, the economic pipelines and, you, and you'll get your answer. And it's really not that complicated. But that second point to your point, Ricky, is that that is at the draft on this. I have had, I, when I was in spring training in February, I was with uh, Sandy Alderson with the A's talking about Ricky, but we were also talking about a bunch of other stuff. And the entire conversation, and when we were talking about, about drafting, was all about control. I said, imagine how different sports would look if baseball had invested academy systems in the United States the way they do in Latin America. Mm. If you gave the territorial rights to a given team, you know, Oakland, with all that black talent, you know, (laughs) gave the Oakland A's that much talent all around the Coliseum. Ricky and Dave Stewart and all those guys grew up right around the Coliseum. However, you can't do that because of the draft. You can get the Dominican players because they're not subject to the draft. There's no international draft. So if you gave the Yankees and the Mets Ooh. New York market, I think they wow. developed black kids who were there. But the whole thing is, pre- it's, 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 it is, it is premised on the draft system, which in a lot of ways you can make the argument that the draft is feeding the racism in these sports now. Mm. Is that, is, is that a, incentive, there's no incentive to develop them. Right, right. Now is that a lack of awareness or a sense of wanting to maintain control because the system benefits who it benefits, you know, benefits those in control? Well, when, I had, when I've had this argument with people in baseball, the argument had been, well, that wouldn't be fair. I mean, look at the black talent that's in Florida and look at the black talent that's in New York. And, but there's no black talent in, in Boston. Boston, I mean, that's a hockey town. So you don't have the same percentage. Or, wh- or what about, you know, if you had to, you know, if you did this in basketball with like Utah, there's no black players. You know, it's an unfair advantage. And my response to that has always been, so what? Life isn't fair. Look at the New York media market. Look at the Chicago media market. You're going to tell me that Indiana's media market can compete with New York's media market? There are plenty of different areas where life isn't fair. The reason to your question, I think, is because they are so entrenched with the system. This is the way it's always been that they're not even thinking about trying anything different. Wow. Well, it's all, we've always had a draft, so we have to have one. Do you? Do you have to have one? I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily. And people say, well, your whole economic system would explode. Let's also not forget that Stan Musial, Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, Carl Yastrzemski, all those guys all said, if you give players free agency, the game will collapse. And the game is richer than ever, and the players have more money than ever. So who knows what's in front of them? I think tying it back to college sports a little bit and amateurism, it's funny, a lot of people don't remember that baseball was once amateur, tennis, golf, almost every major professional sport was once amateur. And that exact argument was made of the moment you introduce compensation, the whole Mm -hmm. system collapses. And magically, (laughs) none of those systems collapsed. You know, they got bigger and better. Right, exactly, because it's it's always interesting to me, again, it's people that don't wanna look at the bigger picture. So like even going back to the unfair, it's unfair to Boston. Well, Boston sends scouts across the country right now. It's not like they're exclusively drafting from UMass you know, exactly. BC, you know, each of these teams already have a scouting system in place. They wouldn't win a game. Right. I mean, they've got JetBlue Field down in, in Fort Myers, so they've already got a physical presence in Florida. Well, and that's the whole point. So, I mean, it, it goes back. I remember this is a fascinating story. At least it was fascinating to me. 1999, 
2000 spring training. I'm, I'm in, I'm in um, Phoenix with the A's. And my boy, Eric Washburn, who's covering for the Celtics now, back then he was at the Contra Costa Times covering the A's with me. And Terrence Long had just been acquired the year before in a trade with the Mets. And it so turned out that Gary looked at the roster and realized that if Terrence Long didn't make the team out of spring training, the A's were going to have no African-Americans on the roster in, in a black city. And Billy Bean lost his shit and calls me. I'm like, what are you calling me for? I didn't write it. He wrote it. What are you calling me for? Anyway, he brings me into his office and he says, do you think I'm a racist? And I said, I don't know why you're asking me this, but if you're asking me, I don't know why are you asking me. He's mad about Gary's story. He's mad about, you know, he said, do you really think that, you know, do you really think I don't want Ken Griffey Jr. or Barry Bonds on my team? And obviously this is all starting to lead up to Moneyball. This is 2000. Mm. And he starts taking out all these reams of paper and starts talking about, you know, it's all salaries. He's got all salary information in his desk. And he says, the black player is the most expensive commodity in baseball. He's looking at Bond, because you guys are the best players right? So he starts looking at Ken Griffey's salary and Mike Cameron's salary and Barry Bonds' salary and Frank Thomas's salary. And he's looking at all these guys and he says, we can't afford this. We can't afford those players. He says, they're too expensive. And once again, this is not ignorance here. Right. What you're talking about is everybody very much understands how these economic systems work. They understand what the draft does. They understand what the draft slotting does. They know all of it. They, you know, I tell people all the time and nobody wants to hear it. In fact, I was on KNBR about this one day and, the, and I think it was one of the, one of the a, one of the Giants owners like called in and disagreed with me, but I didn't care. I was like, listen, winning is not the first thing that professional teams think about. Winning, if you're lucky, winning is fourth. You know, it's fourth. If you're lucky, if you've got one of those organizations that really wants to win a championship, if you... You know, with the Warriors, winning was, you know, came first for, you know, as first as it could be. But control is number one. Right. I mean, first thing, you know, you've got control, you've got to control revenues, you've got to control, you want a relationship with your stadium. You know, you need, those things come way before putting a championship team on the field. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so the, everything that we've talked about in this conversation has been rooted in control. You know, control is number one. Again, these, these teams know what they're doing. Even, even each of these independent systems, which are independent of each other, you know, we go, you know, tying the whole conversation together, starting at youth sports with the focus on you need to be as good at your, your sport as you can possibly be. All right, well, now we've created this control and this dedication to a sport that we can keep controlling you throughout right. the process. And Right, and also at that youth, at the youth level, William Roden's point about the extraction process. So at a very young age, young athletes are start are sort of lured into mm -hmm. being pulled out of the communities from which they come, and I think that also adds to this thing because now it's like, where am I going? Oh, you're coming toward me, right? And the person that or the group or that sort of ideal that they're going toward is where because I, I experienced it, right? I. I throughout my career, and I, I write about this some, it's just this idea of what we're looking for. Um, I think Stephon Marbury tweeted something or posted something the other day about his relationship with Larry Brown and how he basically says his post was, I had a, a dad and a mom at home. I didn't need one, mm -hmm. you, know, at, you know, as a coach. And it's that, you know, when you talk about control, I think that relationship, whereas a lot of us, a lot of times, right, they look at black athletes and they say, well, probably coming from a single fa single parent mm -hmm. background, mm -hmm. coming from this disadvantaged background. So there's this, this sort of patronizing or patrilineal kind of relationship that exists where you, you expect the black athlete to cling to that male leadership, that yeah. male figure, and he's typically white. Yeah, and they rely on that. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Howard, I know you've talked about this quite a bit, the, the analytical movement in a lot of these sports and how they, sports teams have successfully framed this to say, you need to have an Ivy League background to be a member of our front office. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's, again, one of the more disingenuous things that sports right. organizations are doing 
it's not that we're not giving them access, it's that they're not qualified for this set of rules we've created. Well, the goalposts, the goalposts are constantly moving. I mean, if you're gonna talk front offices, it's constantly moving and it's moving so much in the other sports. And I, I always thought about basketball because basketball for some reason always gets exempted. And I know I understand why. Uh, I think it's because it's the numbers of it, but it gets exempted. However, basketball is one of the most difficult sports to get into if you didn't play the game. I was counting up not too long ago and I think it's in full distance or it's in the heritage, one of those two. The number of, of black coaches in NBA history, obviously Bill Russell was first um, in 1966, but the number of black coaches in history is, is voluminous. There are plenty of black coaches in the NBA, right? And therefore people don't look at the NBA as problematic. How many black coaches have you had in the NBA that didn't play the game? It's not even 15. It's like, I think it's 13. So in other words, you want to talk about Barry to entry. So you got to be a world-class athlete first. Right. Just to get a coaching job if you're black in the NBA. You got to be good enough to make the NBA just to coach. Eric Spolcher didn't have that. Bill Fitch didn't have that. You know, right. you, you know, Lawrence Frank didn't have that. You look at, so this is the biggest hurdle. Just to get a coaching job. But because the NBA is 80% black and because you've got plenty of black coaches, nobody talks about it. And yet it's hard, in, in actuality, the NBA is the hardest place to get a coaching job if you're black because of that prerequisite. Wow. Baseball has never had a manager, a black manager who didn't play the game. Mm. Never had one. And in baseball, you didn't just have to play the game. You had to be an all-star. Frank yeah, Robinson, right. Hall of right. Famer, Baker, All-Star, Don Baylor, MVP. You had to be top, top, top level right. when you look at those guys. So there's so many different barriers. And we're not even talking about the front office yet. When I was in, you know, I wrote a column not too long ago that people got all mad about, as always. Um, you know, it said something. I said analytics is racism. And people took that literally because they're just numbers. How can they be? And obviously, it was metaphorical. What I meant was the, the way this is being applied is directly tied and has racial implications. Right, absolutely. And so Ricky Henderson is the greatest base stealer of all time, right? So Ricky stole bases for his career. He retired in 2003 at 44 years of age. He still stole bases at an 80% clip. It's the greatest base stealer of all, 80%. So eight out of 10 times he made it. Today, baseball analytics determine that you have to steal bases at 85% plus in order for it to be a good analytical risk. Wow. So if you're, if you're demanding that the players now steal bases better than the greatest base stealer of all time, what does that do to the black commodity of speed? What does that do to the types of players that you're looking for? You're essentially wiping out base stealing from the game. Who gets wiped out if you're wiping out that speed? You're wiping the Ricky Hendersons and the Lou Brocks and the Willie Wilsons and the Vince Coleman's. You're wiping those guys out of the game because now you're not looking at their skill set as important. So how many black players are you going to have if you don't want anyone to run? I mean, speed is one of the reasons they went after black athletics in the first, black, black athleticism in the first place. So now the way that you're evaluating the game, you're using these numbers to manipulate who you bring in. And that's not to say that only black players are fast, but it is a commodity that you could be a valuable commodity. And who wants to play a game if you can't run? I mean, if you're fast, you want to use your speed, right? So there's that. Then when you're talking about the front office, in the old days, it used to be, and this is now happening in basketball and to a lesser extent in football because football's got so many GM layers. But in, ba in baseball and basketball, first you had to play the game because you had to know the game, right? And then if you, played, if you played ball with everybody, then you got a chance to coach and maybe move up to a GM. But now that pipeline's been broken. Now in baseball, you need an, an Ivy League degree. The reason why Tony Clark is the executive director of the Major League Baseball Players Association, is because when he was about a year or two away from retiring, he wanted to go into the front office of a team. And he went to someone who he still to this day will not tell me who it was, but he was asking 
I'm starting to transition into post into post playing. My career is just about over. What do I have to do to get into a, a GM pipeline to join a front office? And that anonymous person told him, you have to have a four-year degree from an elite university. And the implications were clear, an elite university. We know what we're talking about, right? right. Tony said, I've been in baseball for 25 years. Does that experience count for anything? And the answer was no. So right. then he the union. So they essentially told him that a guy who had been in the league, who had played for Sparky Anderson, who played for Joe Torrey, who had done everything and been considered one of the most respected people, it was no place for him in the front office because he didn't have a four-year degree from an elite university. And he went to San Diego State. So it's not like he's uneducated. I mean, he went to college. He was with Tony Gwynn and those guys. And so, um, I mean, same school as Tony Gwynn. And so um, if this is what you're facing, what chance do you have if you're African-American to go into the front office, especially when you're looking at the Ivy League is 8% Black, 10% 10% Black, Princeton, Harvard, they're the two highest. And then now you're asking Black, the, you're asking the Black students who are at those Ivies to choose baseball, which is a notoriously low paying gig to first get started. So you're going to take $250,000 of debt or whatever you have, and you're going to go into baseball with that. Corporate America is going to snatch you up in a second. So now you have to be able to afford to go take a low paying job to start this long pipeline into baseball, into these front offices. And basketball, is the com- basketball and analytics, it's the same thing now. And so where is your future if you're black and you wanna get into front officing, if you wanna be a GM? Where's your pathway? Where's your pipeline? That, I mean, that is a question that is not really being addressed very well, right. but it's exactly what's happening when you start looking at see the problem is people want to spend so much time talking about racism you want to have these conversations and then the minute you have these conversations most white people that you talk to in the business will 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 talk about jackie robinson or something happy jackie robinson day by the way they want to talk about racism i want to talk about opportunity and pipeline they're not the same thing the end result of this whole story sorry about this you know to billy bean was to me to say to him i don't think you're a racist billy but by definition, the way you look for players and the way you evaluate players and the places where you select players, you are inherently not going to have any black people. And that's mm-hmm. exactly what happened. And now what you're, what you're talking about is progressive identity, right? And what you're talking about is progressing away from sort of the comforts of the system and comforts of the old structure into something that's equitable, fair, and produces actual positive outcomes, right? That produces the type of outcomes that you know, mm-hmm. have, that, that, that we get, you know, black people in or black managers and black coaches and not necessarily saying that they're given these opportunities, but at least there, there's a possibility, right? Damn. Because right now we know that that's not what's happening, right? There's a, very, very tough uh, process of getting, like you said, getting in these circles and getting in these conversations to get jobs. So we understand that, but we're talking about progress. So how important are these progressive uh, ideas and progressive views? And as a society, I know we've got the idea of progress, but I've often felt, and I think you mentioned this a bit earlier, sports is sometimes the best arena for these things to sort of find their way, right? As it was with integration. So how important is it for us to push sort of this, these progressive ideas, these progressive thoughts in sports um, as a way, as, as an example, um, as sports has been in the past? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really important. And then sometimes it feels unimportant. And when I say it's really important, it's because this is the way, right? I mean, what's the option? What options do we have? But the reason why the book is titled Full Dissidence is because at some point, I'm like, they don't, they don't want us in the game. Right. I mean, so what do you do? Like I talk about having that sort of full dissidence moment. What do you do when you realize, okay, we've done everything you've asked us to do. Played the game, played the game at a high level, went to the colleges you told us to go to, did all the things you asked, and there's still no pipeline. Right. And at the same time, held back all of the different positions and thoughts and feelings so we didn't offend anybody either. So we didn't even get a chance to be ourselves. 
and still don't have the opportunity. It's like at the one, on the one hand, you say to yourself, okay, what do we have to do? The other hand, you also recognize, okay, do you, you know, what do you want? Do you want diversity of color or do you want diversity of thought? I always felt that what they really want is diversity of color. You want to have a lot of people who look differently, who think the same. Because when you think the same, you're not affecting the order. You're not upsetting the order. Right. You're not, you know, you're not challenging anyone to do anything differently. And yet you can also tout progress because there's a bunch of people in the room who all came from different backgrounds. Right. So I, I think that, I think it's a, I think it's a matter of the level of honesty that we have in terms of what, what's the actual outcome? What's the goal? And a lot of the, this conversation has been fantastic because one of the things that we're really, the biggest thing that I hear from this conversation is, is structure, structural change. Do we actually want structural change? I mean, this is the, the wheelhouse of what you both are doing. Most times when you get structural changes because you gotta kick the door down. You gotta force it, you've gotta force the, this is, nece you know, this is a necessity now. You know, they're not gonna give it to you. you know, no one's gonna say, you know what, you're right, we should get rid of the draft. I mean, it just doesn't right. happen. Right. So, I mean, I've always, sort of, I've always sort of felt that, you know, I mean, I guess the, one of the things that I've been trying to articulate in, in, on, this, on this concept is, how many rights do we actually have if we have to keep fighting for them? Right. I mean, where do you really fit if you always have to kick down the door? And so maybe you're just a troublemaker or maybe you don't have any rights, you know, and maybe those rights have to keep, you know, continuously being reinforced. And that's the sort yeah. of natural order of things. It's a, it's a really good question. I mean, I feel, I feel a retrenchment. I right. feel more than ever where we are right now. I feel like the rubber is meeting the road. I feel like we're hitting that sort of that point where. Re retrenchment or last gasp. Both, same thing to me. I mean, how many times, like I got, a, I got a email from Bob Costas, the text message, and I'm sorry if I'm talking out of school, Bob, but it was a good email, uh, it was a good text. And he was upset about what I had said about Sam Sater today on, on the show, which I had said, right. you know. And his point was something along the lines of, I do not believe that the majority of white people in this country feel a certain, you know, feel this way about Donald Trump, that they are tolerant of him, that they, he is just as repulsive to, to us as he is to you. And that this is, um, that where we are in this culture, you know, is at a place where there's more in common than you may think. And I thought that was a fine text. I thought it made perfect sense. But it goes back to what we've all been talking about here, about at some point, we have all been guilty of feeling like we could be free while tolerating elements that were against us, right? So we treat these things as differences of opinion when actually they're really threats. And eventually what ends up happening is that you tolerate the threats to the point where you can't fight the threat anymore. And now you realize you're, you're, you're boxed into a, on a corner. And so what I had said to Bob was, we're in a place right now where we're going to find out what everybody's made of. Absolutely. You know? We're gonna find, we're gonna find out. Are are you Mike Shashevsky? Are you really committed to these kids? You know, are we or or are we really committed to ourselves? You're gonna find out from the Nick Sabins of the world, and you're gonna find out from, you know, what are you really committed to? Yeah, they've already shown themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Exactly. The last week, right? The comment about his guys being healthy enough to fight the virus and. Exactly. Get them back to school so we can generate money. Right. 100%. And so now you start to reach this point where how many more excuses can you make when they're showing you? See, that's one of the things about both the last two books, about the heritage and full dissonance. People came to me and they were like, oh, my God, man, really, really good work. Really appreciate it. You know, and, and I said to them, I didn't do anything. I said, this isn't Watergate. You know, this wasn't Iran Contra. I didn't have to do any investigating. They're advertising it. Right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. I, no, nobody sent me some Manila envelope with secret documents in here. They're right. telling exactly what they're doing. And the question is, are you cool with that? 
it's obvious that that you guys aren't you're doing something about it you're fighting it which is what people have been asking someone to do for a really really long time and so we're in a place right now when you talk about retrenchment and last gasp part of that last gasp is bravado stand up and say this is who it is come do something about it it's me driving the lane and you stand in front of the basket right what's it gonna be yeah. and i'm pretty sure you don't let people dunk over you if you can help it right 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 right, right. <laughs> i mean so that that's the battle i think that's where we where we are right now and i feel i think one of the places where i'm at is i feel like there are so many people who still feel like they can lean in and reason and infiltrate and i just don't know if that's working i don't okay. i'm pretty doesn't work anymore. I mean, you know, the NCAA has made it very, very, very clear what their position is. I mean, they're not budging. And so eventually, at some point, how many more seats at the table do you think you can get to make them change? Eventually, you got to kick the door down. A couple of things in there. One, you know, we come across this often in what we're doing, where people will say, oh, you should get in touch with, with this person or that person. You know, they, they've, of course, said something that would indicate that maybe it would make sense to come together. And I often yeah. tell people, you know, I'm not going to use any specifics, but like people are about a cause until it means they have to be about a cause. Exactly. They, talk is cheap. Talk is very easy. Uh, but actually putting action behind that is, is an entirely different value proposition to people. And the, the other thing I would say that the, the ability for guys to actually build a team out and be given right. time oh, that exactly. doesn't happen. Right, the pressure, right, the pressure, right, right. right. Yeah. I, unfounded pressure, right. Yeah, I, I think that after the, after the NFL season ended, you know, I think that the, the black coaches, I don't know if they had their full dissidence moment or not, but they got punched in the face. Yes. They realized they're like, okay, Eric Bieniemy just won the Super Bowl. He didn't get a phone call. You know, I mean, I think that there, it's this. Okay, let's let's look at the sum total of what we have. We don't have anything. And eventually, at some point, you have to accept. They're telling us something. They're telling. They're giving us the message right now that we're not we're not welcome, or that they're not going to hire us, or that you know. I, I, I remember 2015, the Toronto Blue Jays won the division and John Gibbons was a manager and I went to go talk to him. And Gibby used to manage before and back in 08, 09, I think, with the Blue Jays, he got fired and then now he's back. Mm -hmm. And so I go in and I, was, I think this is actually 2014, 2015. And I go into his office, I hadn't seen him in a while and I looked at him and I was like, Gibby, what are you doing here? right? What are you doing here? And he said, man, I don't know. She's like, I was mowing my lawn in San Antonio when the phone rang and Alex Anthopoulos, the GM of the Blue Jays, asked me to manage the club. I was like, so you were mowing the lawn and now you're about to go to the playoffs? Wow. And he's like, yeah. And I said, well, why? Why, why you? And he said, I think Alex as a new GM wanted comfort and I liked Gibby and I enjoy Gibby and the whole thing. And I, I accepted it and I understood it, but there was a part of me that was thinking that's all it took. Right. Right. Have, um, we fight and fight for merit. We fight to put the numbers up. We fight to get in the door. We fight with your stupid Rooney rule and your stupid ceiling rule and all these other rules to try to get in front of somebody. And all it took was comfort. So you just made a phone call to a guy mowing his lawn and he got the job. So these are the battles, right. right? And if it were me running the club and I wanted to, and I wanted a coach that I thought was gonna, you know, not fight with me every single step, step of the way and I needed, I needed success, right. maybe you do the same thing, but we're not in that pipeline. Right. We're not part of it that gets the call when they need comfort. Right, right. And when, and we talk about what what message that sends you 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 had a you had an interview that i heard today and i wanted to ask you about a point you made and i know you said the interview was from a few months ago so i'll try to mm -hmm. the matter? Get up, refresh your refresh your memories of what you mm -hmm. said but you basically answered you said that the people that you felt you felt bad for sort of uh were the younger generations of people who 
sort of their awakening was the Obama moment, right? Yeah. And, and um, the lead up mm -hmm. to his presidency, so to, that whole 2006 and beyond, and then sort of to see where we are now, if you couple that with, like you said, sort of the messaging that we're getting from the professional leagues in terms of their, their, their willingness to hire people and hire black people, hire coaches, hire management people. What is it about that, that response? What, what is it that, that when you look at all of that, that makes you feel for that generation who sort of found their awakening in that moment and sort of have come to this point in our history where socially we're chaotic, people who are inside sports is chaos in sports, like you said, these different these different points that we're constantly being sort of educated on, even though we're unwilling to see them and accept the reality of it. What is the impact on that generation? That yeah, I think that the big thing is, as long as I've been alive, there's only been two ways to talk about race in this country. One is things are better than they used to be, or two is get over it, right? Those are usually the two lanes that we have. Well, it's better than it was. Well, thank goodness for that, right? And so because of that, the argument that we keep hearing, and especially in, under my generation, we did it. I mean, my family, when we left Boston and grew up in, into all white Plymouth down the sh Cape, uh, down South Shore, down by Cape Cod, you know, it was, it's not gonna be like this for us. It's not gonna be like this for us. And I remember my uncle, my uncle used to send me these newspaper clippings every time something happened. Circle it, see, it's the same, see, see. And so for this generation, and you see it on social media, and it used to drive me crazy. A lot of the black kids out there, that the new generation, they're the elites. They're the ones from Dartmouth and Harvard and right. Cornell, and Columbia. They're the ones going on campus and realizing it's the same for them. Right. Right. And so for me, it was like everybody, you know, we all had our moments of progress, but we never got the Obama moment. And that generation, when, you know, that night at Grant Park in 2008. Right, right. It's, see, it's different. Right. And then they got punched in the face. You right. know, they got punched in the face hard. They got punched in the face harder than I think we ever got punched. Mm. Because that began the post-racial moment. Right. And look at right now look at that gap i mean if that if 2008 was your first time voting maybe you believed in democracy a little bit more than the rest of us did you know you see jesse jackson out there crying maybe we've done something right and now look right you know so that's the reason why i feel for them because because maybe they thought they were different just like we all thought we were different and you got the elders saying you ain't different. It's right. the same. It's the same fight. It's the same battle, and it's no different than, you know, what a lot of my white women friends went through with Brett Kavanaugh, and they watched that Kavanaugh hearing, and it was a gut punch, that I don't think, I don't want to speak for them, but having been around, you know, like I said, we live in the white world, right? Having been enough white women my whole life, I mean. They've gotten punched so hard in the last three years, from Kavanaugh to Hillary to Elizabeth Warren. Right. And they're having that full dissidence moment where it's like, what do we got to do? And right. they're looking at it in some ways too. You know, we did everything you told us to do and you still did this to us. They still got the gut punch. Right. And I think that, 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 you know, both that young generation that I always feel, you know, I feel for, I wonder what they're going to do with it. Right, right. That's you the know? question. Right. You know, it's like this, it, it's like that Al Sharpton, Michael Jordan um, exchange that's in the heritage. When I'm sitting there with Rev and we're sitting there talking and, you know, he's going on and on about Michael and about how when, when the shit was hitting, you know, and Michael was the biggest game in town, he never said anything. Where was Michael on this? Where was Michael? Where was Michael? Where was Michael? Where was Michael? Right. You know? Michael was in L.A. during Rodney King. Where was Michael? You know, because the Lakers were playing the Bulls during the, at the, at the, during the finals when that happened. Right. What about it? And I said to him, I said, you know, Rev, maybe, just maybe Michael figured it out better than all of us. That maybe Michael realized that there's not going to be a seat at the table. And that maybe 
money is as good as it's gonna get. So you might as well get as much of it as you can because that's the one thing that you can have in this country. Mm. That you can make money. Mm. And Rev looked at me and he said, true, okay, but you're still a coward. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. It, was, it was amazing, it was an amazing exchange. Wow, right. Oh. I think that we are in a very unique moment. I mean, the Obama era, in a lot of ways. So my my sort of my final slap. Like I had, I've, I've had a few experiences throughout my life. There's a, a famous um, police uh, gun violence case, Philip Pinnell, 1989. You know, he got shot up my up my block, uh, mm -hmm. in and it was a very polarizing event. I was nine, and then it was. You know, throughout those years, there was a few things. There was like a police shooting in Cincinnati while I was in college and the campus was on lockdown for like a week. The city was on curfew. Mm -hmm. But then the final thing for me was Katrina. And it kind of like just... You were playing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it just completely, it completely shook loose all the lasting cobwebs about what <laughs> the desire, it was gone. And then, you know, so by the time Obama came around, I was... I would say I was feeling it just like everyone else, but I was skeptical. Yeah. And I didn't I didn't take the full plunge like the young people I know you you your your references, they took the full plunge. <laughs> and it's how did we get here? But ultimately, where do we go? What what's where the response and what are they gonna do do with it? I hope it's progress it's progress. I hope it's the, the embracing of, of progressive ideas. Um, well, ultimately information implementation of those yeah ideas. and that's the reason why I say what are you gonna do with it you know what will they do with it and it's in it's in their hands the, the question is one of the things that I, I sort of fear is to sort of fall into defeatism we can't win right and that you do go into the sort of silo and and you look at the battles that you guys are fighting where you say we can't beat the NCAA we can't beat them or you look at what's happening in politics, we can't win. Look at the, the numbers are, are overwhelming, or you look at the way that, you know, Kaepernick and the Players Coalition fell out, and it's like, we can't win. And so this is why victories are important. This is why, you know, I mean, David, you know what, being in, in, being in the locker room, hey man, we were down by 25 and we cut it to two, we still lost by four. Like, no, 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 we need to win, you know? Right, right, right. right. <laughs> We can't, we can't have that many moral victories. We can have a couple of them because they give us hope of what we're capable of doing in terms of fight, but we need to win some stuff. And so you need, you need victories. I, I worry and say, you know, I don't listen to a whole lot of stuff that I don't have time for because time is short, but I'm listening to some of these people and like the um, Clarence Thomas, you know, black conservative movements as well. Oh. I remember dealing with that because I'm an 80s kid. So I remember all of that wave happening where, you know, it was Thomas Sowell and Glenn Lowry and all the black conservatives who were out there saying, you know, they were essentially saying what we're talking about. Go get yours. You can't win. You right. can't, beat, you cannot beat this whole system. So take care of yours. My issue has always been, is there a way to do both? Is there a way to make sure that, you know, do you have to be broke if you're a martyr? But at the same time, is there, mm. you know, but if you're not, do you have to completely sell out completely? You know, you, do you, you know, is there some middle ground where you can still fight? I think the way you do that is by getting some victories. I think the way you stay in it is by saying, okay, we're not going to get everything, but we won this one, we won this one, we won that one. If you're constantly going, you know, I got the right ideals, I've got the right politics, I've got the right thoughts, I think I have the right friends and we constantly end up with nothing, then maybe you make different choices. And I'm hoping that's not what this new generation is gonna do. Like for example, like we're looking at this, I don't feel, I, have any, I don't have any problem with people talking about the Democratic Party failing black people. I have no issue with that because right. it happened. But those guys aren't the alternative. Right, right, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. right. You know? So there's that that sort of thing. So what I'm hoping, and I'm certainly like when I when I'm when I'm thinking about some of these different organizations and movements and things that are taking place, I was happy that Ed, o, Ed O'Bannon got a victory. You know, so you're start you're seeing different areas where okay, when you guys 
you know, the PCL, when you guys are strategizing or when, you know, I'm thinking about what stories you, you know, I want to go after, you do have to see pathways. And I think as long as there are pathways, as long as people believe that, you know what, I see an opportunity here where we can make changes, then I, I think we'll be all right. Have to go for it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so is that, in your opinion, bringing it just exclusively honing in on sports for a second, is that the sort of power structure or group of people that you envision that need to come together to bring about systemic change and not just minor or, or sort of facade change? Well, I, I think the Rooney rule is bullshit. I think the Seelig rule is bullshit. I think diversity and inclusion and all of that stuff is, I don't think that's bullshit, but I think that I, I, I like what I'm seeing in baseball in that there are a couple of different movements and I don't, I don't know if it's happening in football or not yet, but you know, the Fritz Pollard Alliance, I mean, mad respect to them for what they're doing but they're banging their head against the wall. I, I like that there's a little movement in baseball that there's a couple of guys, I think Dusty Baker and old Mike Norris from the, the old pitcher from the A's. And I think they're um, Tory Hunter. I think some of the other guys are getting involved in this is they're beginning to create a sort of black analytics Ivy league organization where they're trying to get into some of these schools and they're trying to create that pipeline. That's, interesting to me because right. it's like you can't just beg for the job you got to say okay i'm gonna at least try to come at you you say you're requiring and so maybe there's a way there and i think that you know there's a way to try to um fight them on their own terms because essentially all they can do is keep throwing the lack of resume in your face right. you know well we're looking for this and you don't have this so i think where there's i i, I think that strategically I like the fact that, um, you know, to your point, Ricky, about what, who is it going to take? Who's going to be out front? I like the fact that some of these people that we know have the right values in the game are actually thinking about sort of some of those structural punctures. You know, even if I'm going to lean in on this and say, okay, you know, you're demanding that I have an Ivy League degree. If I can't fight that, I'm going to give you some black people with Ivy League degrees who want to be in baseball, who want to be in basketball. If you're going to force me to embrace analytics, okay, then we're going to create for you a pipeline of people who have embraced it, who don't look like you. That's a part of it. I mean, another part of it would be to get them to think differently, but you can't control that part of it. But what you can do is you can use a lot of those resources that you have and a lot of the influence that you have to give them what they say doesn't exist. You know, they say that the black Ivy leaguer who wants to be in baseball doesn't exist. We'll show them that it does. Um, so I, I like that instead of just, you know, walking around feeling like, like we can't win, there are people in, in the business who have decided, okay, well, let's see if there are some different areas where we see an opportunity to sort of puncture this structure. Everybody's, Cause everybody's not attacking from the same or approaching from the same field. That's one of yep. the messages I try to tell, you know, young athletes that I work with is that you be honest with yourself, particularly about your, your athletic pursuits. Some kids play sports because they're, they're fans and want to be a part of the game, but don't have the physical, right, requirements mm -hmm. to keep going. Mm -hmm. But it's like, you know, young kids will say, well, which direction, I still want to be a part of the game, which direction should I go? I know that there are a few programs and we have a program inside our youth facility where we try to, to introduce kids to like, you know, broadcasting and, you know, sort of being yeah. you know, other elements, right? El you know, being an age and the other elements that go into sports because you know, those are opportunities as well. I didn't, it wasn't until I got to Indiana that I realized how long you could do those jobs at the at an NBA scores desk. I had no idea those were like twenty. 30, I think Charles Barkley made more money broadcasting than he did playing. <laughs> right, right, right. Now maybe he has. Like when I go to the movies, when I take my son to the movies, one of the things we always do at the end of the movie is we sit and watch all the credits. Mm. We do it for two reasons. The first reason is to give mad respect to everybody who made that movie possible. If you enjoyed it, say thank you to everybody who made that possible. Don't just, when you, you know, title screen, get up and leave. You sit down and watch the rest of the, of the credits. Obviously, when you watch Marvel movies, now you have to because you know there's a scene at the end of it you have to wait. <laughs> right, so right, right. kind of like that they did that. But the other reason that I do it was to prove to him, I say to him, look at all those jobs. 
Right. You, can be, you can be in the movies and not be Denzel. And that's one of the things that black people have the biggest problems with, in my opinion, is that we always think and we're always taught that the only way to be in these businesses is to be in front of the camera. That you gotta be David West, you gotta be in the low block, or you gotta be Michael Jordan, or you have to be Denzel Washington. Those are the only jobs we care about. But you can have a 30 year career in the movies and never be in front of the camera. Right. You can be a graphic artist or a CGI person or somebody and work on, I know a whole lot of people who work at ILM, over at Star Wars, up in Marin County, you know, and they've been working there for years and worked on best movies and they've been all part of it and the whole thing. So that is an outstanding and really important thing to remind them that there is a place for you. And yet you went into the business and you don't see any black trainers. You don't see any, you know, basketball's a little bit different, but you really don't see those numbers. I'm not saying the reason is, is because there aren't any. I'm saying there's never, you know, also don't, underestimate the fact that they won't hire you. There's always right. that. But at the same time, I think it's important to remember that you can be part of this and not be the superstar. Mm. You know, you can be in the industry and not be the star. When you're talking to a lot of African Americans who view success only as being at the top of the top, because that's what we've been, that's what we've been told. That's the only way. One, one other thing there, and, and taking your point to the top of the top is in front of the camera, but I think the other element of the, the actual top of the pyramid that people overlook is ownership too. The, the access of whether it's black athletes, black entrepreneurs, whatever the case might be, the access that they get to ownership and the way that these approval processes are set up within these leagues so that many, many roadblocks put in place. Yeah. I know in the heritage, you talked about this with Carmelo Anthony, is another potential part of that power structure having an athlete driven component or, or league even uh, yeah. to really combat what's going on here. Because if you change who's making the decisions at the very top, all of these levels that we've talked about throughout this conversation can also start to be changed. Yeah, but it goes to, it goes to your point earlier about talk being cheap. I mean, when Mello made that point about how if you really thought about it, if you really structure it properly. We as players have enough combined resources to at least try it, to try our own league, to try to create some investment, to try to do something if we really wanted to change the structure. We've got enough to do it. However, he also said, why would you risk anything when someone's just handing you a $12 million check? What's, you don't have to risk anything. It's, it's much, much easier to just go out, play basketball, and have somebody hand you $15 million. There's no risk. So mm -hmm. I understood both points. It reminded me of when Craig Hodges went to Michael Jordan back in the early 90s and told him, hey, Michael, you don't have to be taking scraps from Nike. You're bigger than they are at some level. You can do something. And he was like, nah, you know, I'll let them handle it and go in his own way. So these battles have been around for a long time. These, are, these questions have been around for a long time. And it does take courage. It takes courage and it takes organization. It takes some level of, of uh, charisma to, to send the message that it's possible. I think one of the hardest things about professional sports, and I think the, where we are right now with COVID-19, is reminding us, maybe in somewhat in a positive way, even though it doesn't feel like it, that in sports, we have this idea that it's all intractable, that these industries are so ironclad that nothing can move them. Well, it wasn't that long ago when I was in grade, you know, and I was in the sixth, seventh grade that the NBA finals were on tape delay. That long ago when people looked at some of these sports, you know, that it's possible that you can change things. Rival leagues have a really difficult time. They really mm -hmm. do. We haven't really seen a successful rival league since the ABA where the ABA, the NBA was like, okay, we should probably merge, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Okay, this went on long enough, let's, let's merge. So you've got four teams that got to join the NBA, but the rest of them folded. So I get that part of it, that people say, okay, Mellow, yeah, that sounds good. Sounds real revolutionary, go for it, but you can't compete with them. And I did agree with his point too, where he said, you know, their billions beat our millions. And when you start looking at, the conspiracy, and it is a conspiracy, between 
the, va the vast amount of money that these owners have, plus the broadcast networks that are completely on their side. It's an argument that I've always made when it came to labor. Right. You know, the reason why the broadcast media is not on your side is because the broadcast media has a business relationship with the teams, with the sport. Right. <laughs> They're not going to protect you. Right. So you start looking at those raw dollars. Um, it would require something steady, something remarkable, and something really sustained to, to budget. However, what I do think might be possible is it would be interesting to get an ownership group with some players that had equity that maybe you could begin to puncture it that way. Where, but I don't know if the owners would ever allow that because once you let one in, then all of a sudden you let many in and maybe you start to have player-owned teams. And right. that really changed the entire dynamic of how sports looks. Mm. In that process, what do you think would happen if an athlete ownership group came together to control the athlete pipeline at an earlier stage? Well, I think the biggest thing that, that I worry about is what happens when the underdog becomes the power. Mm -hmm. Do you change your ways or do you just act like them? Meet the new boss, same as the old boss, right? Right. That, like at the, at the end of the heritage, I was talking about that with LeBron and, and Dwayne Wade and all these guys now who have all these mega millions and they've got access and pipeline to power and they're connected to Verizon and T-Mobile and the rest of it. And it's like, okay, so now that you're in charge, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to act like the same guy who's in charge? Or, you know, can you be the power and the protest at the same time? Right. You know, what, what do you end up doing with the fact that it's like, what's the, what's the line about the, you know, the dog that's been chasing the bus and he finally catches it. Now what, <laughs> you know, <laughs> now, you know, and so I'm, I'm real interested in seeing, you know, you're, you know, what, what these guys are going to do, the dollar amounts. I mean, LeBron James's net worth is over 500 million now. It's not too long before he's a billionaire. Um, you know, you're looking at Jay-Z as a billionaire. You're looking at all these guys as, as they're not in the ruling, they're in part of the ruling class. They're not the ruling class. No. I mean, Jeff Bezos is 40 times richer than the richest black person. Right. So they're huge difference. I mean, his ex-wife is richer than the richest black person, and she just got divorced. <laughs> so just so by being divorced, than the richest black person, and that includes Oprah and Michael Jordan combined. By right, the way, right, right. so when you're talking about real wealth, it's a huge, huge, huge battle. But, but that being the case, I do hope that what some of these athletes can do, if they start to move into some of these control positions, is recognize that the structure itself needs to change instead of simply just adopting, okay, I'm gonna take your job and do the exact same thing you did, right? What, what, good does, what good does that do anybody? I'm actually really worried about that because so many times when we fight for things, you fight to win, but then you don't follow up on the reason why you were fighting. You become what you were fighting. You know, you're seeing that a little bit in tennis. Um, you've got, you know, Roger Federer and a lot of these guys are now, you know, they're managing some of the younger players. But the same structure's in place. Is it really a victory that, you know, you get to kick out Donald Sterling and then acted like Donald Sterling? I mean, what good does it do? So, you know, been great conversation so far. Just got a couple more questions. These are a little bit lighter. I'll frame, I'll frame the first one. Um, a lot of people don't know this about me, and I, I, I tell people. So I failed as a senior in high school. I had to fail, flunked out as a senior in high school. I had to do an extra year of military school to graduate high school. And it was, you know, it was a tough moment for me. But as I look back, it was literally the best thing that happened to me. You know, so I call it my fail up moment. And mm -hmm. so what I, I want to do is I just, I like to ask, you know, our guests, you know, if they had a fail up moment and what that was and you know, what was the impact that that fail up moment had uh, on you? Too many to count? <laughs> 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 oh goodness um, you have company in that general <laughs> answer right there that that's what andre said too <laughs> what, would be, what would be my my fail up moment where you fall out of the tree and land on your feet well okay. yeah probably temple university yeah temple university that was 
that was one where the university went on strike in 1990. Yeah, they went on strike in 1990. The faculty went on strike fall semester 90, and I was the editor of the um, of the student paper. And we were really going hard on the on the administration for not giving proper health benefits to the faculty. There was all this conversation about whether or not they were going to cancel the semester. And so because of that, we had more and more time not to pay for the semester. Right, right. So right. I missed the deadline and didn't pay for my semester. And because of that, they, you know, the university was mad at me because I was so hard on them anyway. Right. So retroactively take my check. So they, I got bounced as editor. Oh, wow. All I had to do was pay up, but I didn't have a lot of money. I was trying to stretch it out as long as I could. You know, out of that moment came an opportunity that I had no, I had, I had no idea was going to be there, which was after being out, I ended up getting a phone call from the Philadelphia Inquirer and they were like, we like your spirit. And I was like, yeah, but I didn't pay my bills. <laughs> <laughs> and so they kind of took pity on me and I got a job at the Inquirer as a, as a reporter. And that's where I met the Pulitzer Prize winning editor, Asa Moore. And I enrolled wow. back in school. He was one of my teachers. He connected me to San Francisco State where I transferred to. And then there you go. There you go. Hey, and that's more. that's yeah. how I got my first job at the Oakland Tribune. And there's your career. Right, absolutely. And now the second question, again, I was I was born in 1980, came up in the 90s, toward the end of the 90s, toward, toward, the, toward the end of the 90s, there was, you know, there was this push toward, uh, I would say, you know, being a, a, a thinker, and then the early 2000s was all this mindfulness and uh, routine, and so um, I'm, I'm always curious about people and what they do in the morning. So it was a big thing about morning routines. And I'm always curious about what people do in the morning. So what's the th what do you do in the morning that sort of gets your day rolling? As I'm the worst person to ask that question. Because, really? yeah, two reasons. One, I'm a night owl. Okay. Because I cover baseball. I mean, this is the, you can thank Wilt Chamberlain for this, but you guys have shoot around, so you don't really get to stay up that late. Whereas baseball, when the game, you know, I cover baseball, we get done with the game at, you know, 10 o'clock, 10, 15, I'm out of the ballpark at 1130 or so. We don't have to be back at the ballpark till like four o'clock. I would be like, when I was on the road, I'm like, I mean, if I'm in bed by four, I can still get eight hours. Right. And, <laughs> and so, you know, I've written, I'm working, this is on book number 10 now. And I, I write all my books overnight. I went wow. to bed, I went to bed at five this morning. So, so I guess the real answer to the question is that how do I start my morning? I start it by going to bed. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. So yeah. I, All right. I got up this morning. I woke up at 1.15 and I was like, oh man, are we doing the pod right now? I didn't even know. I had no idea. Right. What. <laughs> I, I'm pretty bad at it when I do have to get up because now that you got a child, you got to get him up for school and everything. Learning how to eat breakfast. So when I work at home, I... I always make it a point to get up, take a shower, get ready like I'm leaving the house so I like feel like I'm awake and doing something. Right. Um, generally speaking, I am useless in the mornings. I'm just not oh. very, yeah. Wow. Okay, well, good deal. We've learned something <laughs> from that regardless. There are all types of types out there, man. I mean, right, yeah, my, my wife was a figure skater, so her entire childhood was spent at 5 a.m. practices. I was a baseball player where most of our games were at night, you know, so again, like, I'm ready to work out in the evenings. She wants to work out first thing in the morning. Yeah. Oh, All I types was in, of types. I lived, in, when I lived in San Francisco. I lived in the hate and I used to date this girl and we both worked at night, but she was a morning person. So she would get up at like six o'clock and one, I'm like, nope, we, can, we don't break up. And we right. do. <laughs> <laughs> like, do not close to waking me up one i don't drink coffee and two there's no way you're waking me up at 5 45 for any reason unless i got a flight to catch right 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 <laughs> and one other lighter note question i like to ask is when all of this is over and the all clear is given by medical professionals what are you most looking forward to doing when uh the social distancing period is over playing tennis i had to get back out there and work on my game i have not hit I've not hit a ball in 
a month, two months now, not even two months, yeah, it's been about a month now, and um, I miss playing. I mean, body in motion stays in motion, and I feel, I feel right. like, I feel awful right now. I can't even move right now. So <laughs> I'm very, very, very much looking forward to getting out there and hitting some balls. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Well, this was a fantastic conversation, Howard. Thanks again for joining oh, us. Glad I finally got a chance to talk to you. And I was going to say, and David, I've been wanting to talk to you for forever anyway, because my boy Monty Poole always talked about how great you were to him in, uh, in the Bay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really good guy. Monty was a good guy. And I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Like I said, you know, before, man, I'm a, you know, I've, I've been a, a huge fan of yours for a while, just from a distance. And we connected a few years, you know, yeah. back over Twitter. And um, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. I, said, I, I know sometimes, and I feel it sometimes, because one of your favorite tweets that is when you just, I know you're fed up because you'll just say, it's all bullshit. And I, just, <laughs> I, just, I love, but it, it, that's, it, it speaks to me because I'm like, I understand where he probably is. Like, it's just too much. Right, yeah. Things are just coming mm -hmm. and it's just all bullshit. It's all bullshit. It's true. Well, I'll tell you what's been real interesting about it, and I'm, I'm concerned, is that the march is on, man. It's happening right now, right? right? And the reactions that we're getting in terms of not really covering this stuff and not really addressing it. On right. the one hand, there's opportunity, but on the other hand, it goes back to that thing before about sort of, you know, the, the despair of, um, what are you gonna do with the moment that you're in right now? Right, and, right, right. And, and, and that's, that's a big question for a lot of people. For all of us, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just a reminder for our, for our viewers, listeners, if you haven't already, be sure to check out The Heritage and Full Dissidents. You will definitely thank us if you take the time to read those. Again, Howard, thank you for joining us. This was awesome. Uh, and that's a wrap on Forward Thinking.